and we were doing this. Appreciate as being part of, uh, you know, the honoring of uh, Martin Luther King, may he rest in peace as well, which you bring to mind. It's also too bishuvat, it doesn't feel like that outside, but the trees are experiencing uh, the ice and things like this, but it means there's a little driplet of beginning of the early spring uh, in the background. But, but, but everything is overshadowed by the horrific experience of what happened on Shabbat at this sweet shul in right outside Dallas, Texas. And I know all of us are still just traumatized by the experience, including myself. Um, you know, there's much to discuss here. This is not the focus of our meeting today. I will simply say that Tu B'Shavat teaches is that about the tree. The tree is one of the key metaphors and analogies of the Torah, the tree of life to those who hold fast to it, always ways uh, find peace. And Tu B'Shavat about the tree beyond the tree is a source of life, a beauty, of, a beauty of nature, of God's gifts of creation. The idea of Tu B'Shavat, of course, is that there's a little bit of sap on the inside. You may not see it, but that it's starting the journey towards flowering, towards the spring. And I'm so proud to say that our people in this case, you know, we have been a people that we may appear to be uh, vulnerable or you know, fragile. Things may see on the outside challenged, but on the inside, we have that spark, that spark of love of Torah, love of community, love of each other, love of humanity. And I know that we will, as we say, Am Yisrael Chai, like a tree, it will come back, it will revitalize, it will continue to thrive. And we do that because of our, our love for each other, our connection with each other and gratitude. With that, in honor of Tubishvat, this community, please God, the rabbi in Texas, as well as our congregation, in honor of all our people, I offer this very brief prayer. Eloheinu velohe avoteinu vimoteinu, Elohe achayim, O God, the God of our foremothers and our forefathers, the God of life, please let this gathering here today be an expression of our commitment to life. We ask you to give blessings of calm, of love, of support to those in Texas, specifically in that beautiful Shul Beth Israel and the rabbi and give them life giving strength and calm and your love and presence. But may you give strength to all our people, to all those throughout the world who feel vulnerable and threatened, but specifically to our people who feel that strong now. God stand beside us, give us strength and help us to do what we're doing right here, which is continue exploring and pushing forward as Jews, because that is what we do with your help. And we say this, amen, 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 amen. amen. Turn it back to you, Devorah. Thank you, Rabbi. All right, I'm gonna spotlight Susanna, I think. Um, I've never done this before, we'll see how this works. And then Susanna is going to be our first speaker. Are you ready, Susanna? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, there you go. You're right. Hi, I'm Susanna. And the topic I chose to focus on today is a warning against indifference. In school, I was introduced to the concept of, ind of indifference by a speech written by Elie Wiesel. But first, I would like to ask, what is indifference and how does it apply to our daily lives? Lo tucha lehitalem. From chapter 22, verse 3 in Deuteronomy, this translates as you must not remain indifferent. It can also be translated literally as you shall not act as if you are blind. I find this interesting because to remain indifferent means to not care about something or someone. In the Torah, to not remain indifferent means to assist others and take care of any lost possession of another. The Torah is implying that we are obliged to help others, even if they are your sworn enemy. Medieval commenter Nachmanides states that, assist others, remember the bond of humanity between you, and forget the hatred. I believe that the reason we are supposed to help others is because as a people, not just a religion or ethnicity, we have the responsibility to do the right thing when others might ignore the problem. The Torah provides examples of how not to remain indifferent. Today, in chapter 23, verse 16 in Deuteronomy, the Torah talks about how if a slave has run away from their owners and needs refuge, you, can, you must treat them with respect. You can't just say, nope, I can't offer, offer you temporary refuge, goodbye. We have the responsibility to help those in need. Rabbi Harvey Fields interprets that indifference is intolerable, responsible caring is at the heart of Jewish ethics. I remember a time when I wasn't indifferent to what was happening around me or in my life. I was in fifth grade, it was recess, and I was bored. I noticed that my friend was being put into an uncomfortable position by other friends of mine to a point where she was in pain. Before I knew what I, before I knew what I was doing, I stood up I stood up and went over to help my friend. I spotted some other students watching and told them to inform the teachers of the situation. 
Then, knowing that I could damage my relationship with my other friends, I went over and pulled them away from my friend that they were hurting. I yelled at them, expressing my anger and their poor judgment and treatment. What they did was not right. Looking back on what happened, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I now understand the importance of standing up for what I believe in and doing what I think is right. In the moment, I had confidence and determination to step up and protect my friend. If I hadn't acted, my friend could have been hurt a lot more. The thing that I've noticed is that inconvenient things are the intersection of the actions required to avoid indifference. If you're not a little uncomfortable, then you might not be doing the right thing. As we all know, indifference does not stay only in the schoolyard. Though not one person can solve all of the world's problems, indifference is all around the world and occurs on many levels. As I stated earlier, I was first introduced to indifference from Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor who wrote books and speeches. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986 and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In his speech, The Perils of Indifference, he said that indifference is not a beginning, it is an end. And therefore, indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never his victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. And in denying their humanity, we betray our own. Indifference, then, is not only a sin, it is a punishment. Elie Wiesel was, of course, talking about the Holocaust and the many ways that people and leaders could have taken action. It is too large of a task to go over all the many examples. Many people have addressed this and many more will continue to do so. I want to focus on the present as well as the things that haven't happened yet. To truly not be indifferent, the Torah calls upon us to apply these lessons in real time. Today, we face issues around the world that require our attention. You don't have to look far or wait long to see the world's imperfections but our denial for what is happening is what blinds us. Whether it is military conflicts, refugees, immigration, the environment, or our reaction to a global pandemic, there has always been an opportunity to act earlier. Today, we are in many ways consumed by the global pandemic. To date, over 849,000 people have died from COVID-19 in the US alone. Here at Beth Meyer, we are trying to make a difference. People are wearing masks during in-person gatherings and many have also opted to join virtually. Our religious school has made our classes more available for those in person and online. These examples of not being indifferent, unfortunately, do not spread far enough into the society around us. I've noticed a key factor of indifference is that we are oftentimes reacting to things that we haven't experienced yet that we aren't indifferent until they affect us personally. Oftentimes we simply deny or put off the challenges or problems we know about but hope not to face. The challenge of fighting a difference is that it calls upon us to take action. Denial, on the other hand, is the defense mechanism that can be used to avoid dealing with these moral dilemmas. Thus, denial becomes indifference. In the future, what will you do next time you're faced with a challenge? Will you choose to deny the situation and later face the consequences? I personally, I personally had to fade these questions as my family prepared for my bat mitzvah and the celebration afterwards in August of 2021. I realized that simply having my party as I planned would make me indifferent to the dangers of the pandemic and the risks posed by the new Delta variant at the time. Once I realized this, the decision to modify our plans was disappointing, but the health of others must come before myself. Nahama Leibowitz, Zionist winner of the Israel Prize in 1956 and Torah scholar states that, indifference does not present a world where all people get along with one another or rush to care for one another's property. Instead, it takes into account the grim rea reality that people do not achieve the desired observance of you shall not hate others in your heart. She is right, our world is not perfect, but can't we try to make a difference? To get rid of indifference? To, pr to provide a safer life for all the inhabitants of this home we call Earth? There is indifference all around us. If we can identify indifference, we can work to prevent it. If it is from standing up to a bully at school 
or donating to a charity that helps others around the world. Even small things can have big impacts. When you face your next dilemma, what will you do? Will you respond with indifference or will you embrace the challenge with open arms, even though you do not know what could happen? Thank you for your time. You're Thank muted. Thank you so Martin. much. Yes, I'm unmuted now. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And of course, a call to action, which I hope that we'll all be able to heed in some way. Um, uh, Jim, do you want to do any follow up or should we just wait? We'll wait. Okay. All right. In that case, um, I'm going to introduce Alan. And um, Alan, you're on. All right. Um, well, I'm going to be far less polished than Susanna. I've took Svi at uh, his, his uh, best and focused on uh, really uh, providing you some background into where uh, I may have, where I developed um, uh, the politics or, or the ethics that I try to live in my life. Uh, and then how that interconnects with the things that I do both as a business person and as a private person uh, to support that and around the context of, of my Jewish faith. So I'll start with a little bit of the personal path to, to, to where I am. And I come from a somewhat disconnected uh, way to everything. I start out with um, being the grandchild of French Canadian immigrants who came to, to the US at the turn of the century. And from the age of uh, 10, both, both of my grandparents uh, working in the mills uh, of, of Maine to help uh, create, to, to build uh, wool and, and to process wood as, as you do in Maine. Um, the reason I mentioned that is that my politics were really formed in utero. My grandparents, uh, my parents um, were workers. My grandfather was a union organizer. There was no possibility of being anything other than a Democrat and no possibility of being anything other than uh, a worker's advocate. And so the whole concept of progressive politics or progressivism to my grandparents and to my family would be somewhat confusing because for them, their politics was what they lived. And so that approach and, and that connection um, has always been a, a really key, strong part of my life. And their, their background, their, their nurturing was key. Now, until I was 13 years old, I was raised as a Catholic. And when I was 13, uh, my father picked me up from school one day and drove me 45 minutes to a synagogue in the town closest to us and dropped me off on a Tuesday and said, this is where you'll be going every Tuesday from now on which was a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, when I went inside, it wasn't my father that explained to me while I was going, it was the rabbi. And that was that my grandfather was Jewish and that he had passed away and my father had felt the need to make that connection, which proved to be pivotal for me. And I was very, very fortunate to have an extraordinary rabbi at the time who, who was able to draw a picture for me of Judaism as responsibility and action. And it fit neatly into what I had experienced with my grandparents and with my family, uh, but not what I had experienced as a Catholic, which was very much focused on the world and doing things to ensure the world uh, uh, to come as opposed to the world that we're in. So that connection to Judaism as a faith that requires us to be responsible 
that requires us to ask, that requires us to speak out, um, was a very key component of, of uh, both my adolescence and of my life as I move forward. Something that I fought against actively because I was the only person in my family that was going to a synagogue. And uh, that was something I didn't think I could do. And I pushed away from for a very, very long time until my thirties. Uh, but nonetheless, it still remained connected. The other key component before I talk about my current life and what I'm doing and, and how I'm trying uh, to make change comes on the business side. Growing up with union organizers, working for the business was about as anathema as I could possibly imagine. And my entree into business came um, working for a power company. My education and my master's degree is in library science. And I moved back to Maine as a librarian for a power company. And in the context of uh, working at the power company, the president of that company who actually turned, turned out to be a huge influence on my life, um, made a point of seeing something and challenging me to be more than what I thought I could be. And also taught me that business was not something that um, could not, that had the inability to make positive change. And in fact, that good business could make extraordinary change um, in organizations. And so with that, uh, I started as librarian and left 13 years later as the head of their international division. And that change brought me into the world of, of business. So all of that sort of leads to, to this current moment for me. And what I've learned and what I try to bring together is that my, my personal life and my work life, my Jewish life, all interconnect together. And so the causes that are important to me and the causes that I support and celebrate are those that start with my own organization and ensuring for the employees of our company and for the employees that we support in the countries around the world that we are creating a company that creates the opportunity for every person there to be authentically who they are and to live that in a supportive an effective environment. What's interesting to me is the state of North Carolina has as its motto in English, the term to be rather than to seem, which is always extraordinary. We've absorbed that into our own organization. Uh, I think so much of our current government forgets what those words mean, but for us, to me, they are the most Jewish words uh, they are the most uh, real words, and they are the heart of everything that we and I try to do as, as um, an organization and as an individual to ensure that the community that we live in, the work that we're doing is allowing everyone to authentically be themselves and to do it in a way where it is not just tolerated, but celebrated and not just celebrated, but it's also supported and individuals are made safe to be able to do that. A lot of, of what we do and I do is just trying to live by example. And as a global company, there are parts of the world where my relationship with my husband or my Jewishness is something that we are oftentimes encouraged not to discuss. We work in the Middle East, we work in Asia, we have employees in countries where being gay is not to just uh, frowned upon, it is legal, illegal. Uh, we have issues where in the Middle East, working with someone who is Jewish is not something that is encouraged or um, something that easily leads to, to the success of an organization. Our response to that and my response has always been to ensure that, that I am who I am 
that I don't go back into the closet. I don't go back and change the things that I do. And it's in, in fact, in being who you are that uh, things are changed. And that's the experience that we have, we have had as organizations. Now, what we support are LGBTQ rights around the world. And we do that more than just in providing financial uh, support. We are actively engaged with organizations in providing pro bono services to most of the LGBTQIA organizations in all of the 15 countries in which we have service centers and employees. We also are around advocating and supporting women's rights in those organizations. And by doing that also within our own company. Uh, in India, we work with the victims of um, acid abuse. So uh, as you may know, um, one of the honor effects in, in India and other parts of the world, if a, a woman has dishonored her family in some way that the easiest thing the family can do is mark her by throwing acid in her face. Um, we have worked not only with the charities in India uh, to, to support them in trying to make change, but we've also brought on board and hired uh, victims uh, who were not being able to find employment in other places. So, the background that we have is an activist background, not just in the personal space, but it's an activist background in the business space, that we recognize that our example is a statement, not just to our own employees, it's a statement to a community of the things that we value and who we are. And it has been an integral part of, of what we have tried uh, to do. And, in terms of how I, I live my life and what is progressive, it is simply that it is being open, uh, it is being honest, and it is being connected. I keep forgetting I muted myself. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm going to highlight Zach and Zach, um, it's your, your on. Great. Great. Um, thank you all for having me. And um, thanks, Alan and uh, Susanna, for uh, those uh, wonderful words and, and insights. Um, very inspirational. Um, I, um, I, I start a bit with me, um, and then I'll get to the values piece. I think like Alan, um, I, I looked at, you know, how, how Jewish values influenced, um, you know, kind of the, the way that I live and the work that I do. Um, I'll be the first to admit that like, this was a, a little bit of a struggle for me. Um, and, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but, uh, you know, foremost, as, as we started with, um, just my, my thoughts, uh, you know, prayers or, or with the, the, um, uh, congregation of Beth Israel and, uh, in Colleyville, Texas. Uh, my wife's from Dallas. We were married in Dallas, you know, Rabbi Jenny's, uh, from Dallas. Uh, and, um, while, while, you know, not, not, not Colleyville, you know, tangentially related. So, you know, um, hit, you know, especially, uh, close to home and had a lot of people reaching out. I'm, I'm a native of Greensboro. Um, and, uh, as, as I mentioned, I attended Temple, uh, Emanuel and, uh, my parents and sister, um, are still in Greensboro. Um, and, uh, that's actually where I first met Svi, um, and Sherry. I, I can't remember a point in my life where I didn't know Svi Shapiro. Um, and Svi, actually I'll weave into, to, to the values piece, um, here, here in a bit. Um, my wife, uh, Sadie and I have been, uh, members of Beth Meyer for almost four years, um, and really love and cherish it. Um, our, our three-year-old Benny, um, who uh, um, his namesake is his, his grandfather. Uh, he's at um, the daycare and Drew, our one-year-old daughter is just about to start the daycare uh, next month. Um, and so we, you know, love and cherish being part of the community um, and, you know, being, being part of conversations like this. Uh, my wife, Sadie, um, I was gonna say last year, but it was definitely pre-COVID, um, spoke to the, the group about her work um, and she, you know, would be an excellent resource on this topic as well. Um, she uh, 
as a senior advisor for, for Governor Cooper around communications and many other things. Um, so my, um, my path and my career, I'm 41 years old. Um, I'm a new-ish father, and I think that you know, has been sort of part of the uh, journey for me in, in thinking about you know, values and kind of how I, I, I live. Um, a lot of um, what I was thinking about around this conversation didn't quite roll off the tongue, which was, you know, again, interesting for me. Um, but I, I've, I've worked um, in electoral politics you know, on the progressive side for over 20 years. It started for me, um, you know, at least professionally, uh, with an internship on John Edwards' first campaign in 2003. Um, I was actually interning in his Senate office in Washington. And then uh, they, they said they'd actually pay me um, to, uh, uh, to go to Iowa. Um, and uh, I, I organized the first Iowa caucus there. It was really that um, to America's message that, that resonated with me. Um, and again, I'll, I'll kind of get back to the, the why here. And, and I started a career, uh, at least the first sort of 10 years um, post-college for me of working on different campaigns around the country um, and you know, lived in a lot of places I never thought I would would um, and experienced a lot of these smaller Jewish communities in places like Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, um, De Des Moines, Iowa, uh, Tucson, Arizona. Um, I, I worked on uh, Tom Daschle's campaign when he lost in 2004, Claire McCaskill's uh, Senate, uh, first Senate victory in 2006. Um, back with Edwards again uh, on the dark side campaign, the first one he was uh, on the, the, the side of the force, the second one was the dark side. Um, managed one of Gabby Giffords campaigns, her first reelection in Tucson, Arizona. Um, bounced kind of in and out of Washington, DC, uh, but made a career of uh, working again on the electoral side um, for candidates you know, whom, whom I believed in, um, on issues that, that I, I believed in. Um, and, um, I, um, uh, you know, currently, um, uh, I would say, you know, that was for about 10 years. And then after that, uh, I went back to grad school, um, and got a master's in public administration, uh, and then started working for a consulting firm in DC, still doing a lot of work on campaigns, uh, and advocacy, and then hopped over to Google, got really interested in the technology side of, um, uh, of, of politics and how we communicate our message, um, but still stayed, you know, it, it very involved on, on uh, political campaigns, uh, just more on the sort of the advertising side, side of the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, when I got this invitation from, from SVI, um, you know, uh, around what is it, um, you know, living a progressive Jewish life look like and, and how my values have influenced me, um, as I mentioned, it didn't quite roll off the tongue. Um, uh, and it took me a little while to kind of, you know, I don't know, kind of, you know, kind of unpack or explore why. Um, when I do think about Jewish values though, you know, where, where I go and what I would uh, point to, um, you know, really are three. Uh, the, the, the notion of sadaka, of charity, of giving, I think literally, uh, correct me rabbi if i'm wrong but righteousness um you know is something that um we, we grew up with i can remember you know being uh uh you know, early memories at the um shabbat table uh putting you know uh coins in the sadaka box and then giving them to charity uh later on um takun olam is something that was you know very often uh talked about my family growing up uh, and, and this idea of repairing the world is something that, you know, I look at, I draw from. Um, and then looking out for the marginalized, the, the story of Passover, uh, looking out for the stranger in the new land is something that I, I come back to over and over. Um, and so, um, you know, getting back to the sort of the, you know, the, the, the values piece, um, you know, for me, I think a lot of this was um, just sort of baked into my, my upbringing. Um, and when I think back like my own personal narrative, um, 
really, you know, it was about the actions um, and the stories I was told and a little less about, about the words. Um, I, I, you know, um, like Alan, um, my, my great uncle, uh, Will Weinstone, um, I've learned and, you know, again, heard stories growing up, was a, a founding member of the UAW, um, actually uh, um, ran for uh, mayor of New York City, and I believe even president um, on the communist ticket, um, but, uh, you know, was a labor organizer and, and um, uh, you know, played sort of a prolific role in uh, my, my father's sort of world and, and, and um, kind of, you know, the, the work that he ended up doing. He was a social work professor in Greensboro for 39 years. Um, and and um, Svi may, may have been part of this protest or it, it could have been uh, another one, but uh, organized uh, peaceful protest against the, the Klan when they marched uh, in um, the 80s. It was uh, an anniversary uh, of the, the, the shootout that happened in Greensboro, um, but it, it was, it was uh, uh, the, the, my, as my father tells it, five or six years after, and they were doing a big march through downtown Greensboro, um, which has a lot of significance uh, because of the, the Woolworth and the, the sit-ins. Um, my father helped organize the, the a protest against it. Again, peaceful, um, but um, you know, it was an early demonstration to me of, you know, of, of, of action and standing up to injustice. Um, my father, my grandfather, I uh, learned up, learned hear, hearing the stories of, of Benny Weinberg, um, who, and now our son is named after, like many of you, uh, uh, here on this zoom grandparents or great, great grandfathers owned stores. Um, it's what a lot of the early immigrants did upstate New York. Uh, he did, he was one of the, the first to extend lines of credit, uh, to the black community. And um, as my father tells the story and talks about him, he, he um, saw people for who they were, um, you know, not the color of their skin. Uh, and it was a, was a beloved man uh, in, in the community. Um, when, when I was uh, uh, elementary school in Greensboro, my, my mother pulled me out to go to the 25th anniversary of the Woolworth sit-ins. Um, and we, you know, went downtown and, you know, wit witnessed that. Um, and, and, and so, you know, over and over again, um, you know, sort of what I, I have come to discover that, you know, this, this idea of, uh, of action, you know, of justice, um, it, it, uh, of looking out for the marginalized uh, is, is something that, you know, again, is sort of part of my, my personal narrative, my arc, what I grew up with, um, and, you know, has, has manifested in, into what I do today, uh, professionally, how I live my life, um, and, and uh, you know, and, and my, you know, what I, what I would say are my core values. Um, and part of why I think this is, you know, so interesting for me right now as well is um, I'm a new father. And so, um, uh, you know, as, as Alan said, um, you know, how, how, how he lives his life uh, is, is important. And these things are all sort of woven together. And I'm beginning to realize, you know, it's, it's the, the moments when nobody, nobody's looking are the important moments. Um, uh, because you know what, the three-year-old actually is looking uh, and he's, he's listening. Uh, <laughs> and that he's rep repeating cuss words. <laughs> uh, and, and so um, I think it's, it's you know, it's uh, uh, it, the, the conversation for me uh, and the exploration for me is, is even that much more important. Uh, and lo and behold, it, it's all rooted in, in Judaism and Jewish values and the Jewish story and the Jewish narrative. For me, action has meant um, electoral politics and uh, going and working for people who I believe in. But, um, you know, it, it means a lot of different things for different people. And for some people, it, you know, it, it, it may not mean action, um, but, but it could be, uh, you know, working for an organization. It could be how you live your life. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it could be uh, running for office yourself. Um, there's a lot of different sort of, uh, you know, ways to think about that. And this is the path that, you know, has, has made sense to me um, and that I've enjoyed. And, and again, I think is rooted in uh, Judaism, Jewish values uh, and the like. So uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this back to Jim in just a minute. But Zach, I just have to say something. Um, you know the game of Jewish geography. I can never play that because I'm always on the outside of it because we were outside the organized Jewish community. But my father was also one of the organizers of the UAW and he probably knew your grandfather. Oh, although, wow. of course, there's no way for us to know now. Um, but he was in the first sit-in strike in, in the Fisher body plant in Detroit. I knew that story my whole life. Oh, wow. um, my parents were not communists because the party was Stalinist and they were Trotskyites, but they were definitely there. So, <laughs> yeah, look up. Uh, Will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Will Will Weinstone. Look up, if you look him up on Wikipedia. Uh, I look. I mean, like I said, you know, my father's gone now, so I can't yeah. ask him. But, but I, yeah. my guess would be, I mean, it was a small group, so my guess would be that they knew each other. So, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to play to play this game. I've never been able to do it before, as well as you're speaking. All right, cool. um, uh, Jim, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Oh, Svi, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I do, and that is that I have a picture on my wall, reference. To the, the KKK march that your dad and I attended together in in um, Greensboro, and actually we, we, we were your dad is actually in this picture, and yeah. it's actually a, a well-known Jewish quote which says how good and pleasant it is to do, dwell together in unity. We were holding that, and we had a, we we were we we was a march was a protest that we did silently. Which was very difficult for a lot of us to be totally silent <laughs> while people walk by with hoods on, but it's memorable. It was in the eighties, and so it's a small circle, Zach. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, Svi. Yeah. Yeah. Right up in our very house. cool. All right, Jim. I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. <laughs> um, I have questions that I've written for each of the speakers in case um, we have a lull. Um, if there's um, anyone who has something they would like to ask, um, we're a small enough group, at least of the people whose pictures you can see, um, that if you make yourself known to me in the pictures, I can call on you. Um, if you're not, if I'm not seeing you, use one of the reactions, um, you know, from Zoom or, and if, you're, if your picture isn't there and you don't want it to be, also do that or put your question in the chat. Um, and your questions can be directed at, at any one of our panelists or to them as a group. And at some point I'm gonna call on the panelists to kind of ask each other questions or, or think of anything they might wanna um, say that might draw their experience closer to or in contrast with one of the others. But for now, I think what I wanna do is, is um, just get started by asking this question of Alan. Um, so Alan, you are basically living out your Jewish progressive life through your company, through your work. And I'm wondering if you have any sense of how what you do as a Jewish progressive would be different if you were, say, a Catholic progressive, um, or if you were a, a Jewish person, but who might not be politically progressive? Like, is there something about the intersection of progressive um, thinking and Judaism that makes your company do what I think many of us would call um, act, uh, act, activism through action? Uh, let me let me see if I have a, a good answer to that. I, I think um, the what is a little bit different that, or what I would describe as being different is the fact that we try to be visible in the actions that we take and not visible so that everyone knows it's WPO in a marketing kind of way, but visible so people know it's our name, that we're putting our effort to it. And you know, in business, you never you, you, you never talk about politics and religion. Uh, you you don't want to annoy anybody because the person you annoy might be your next client. And for us, one of the things that I think is different is we've decided that sometimes not every client is the right client, and that if who we are and what we say and what we do annoys you, then you're probably going to get really peeved on all the other things we're going to do. So let's just, you know, cut, cut our losses at that point. So, so I think 
that willingness to actually do, but to stand up for what you do is different because of, um, of my Jewishness. And as the CEO of the company, it's sort of, and it's a private company still. So I get to live that out in a, in a complete way. Follow up with that is, do you think that doing that uh, has has helped to make your company successful, or is your company successful despite drawing these important lines that you just won't cross ethically? I think it's it's made us more successful because ultimately, I think that there are far more people in the world who want to do good things than there are people who want to do bad things. Mm-hmm. And I also know that there have been lots of times where we have been counseled not to say something or to not act in in a way that we want to act. And and what I've learned is that it's exactly at those moments when people tell you not to talk, that you really need to be loud. And so those are circumstances where we've gone like to the Middle East and I talk about my African-American husband and my Jewish background to the, the Saudi Uh, buyers of of some service, despite being told not to. And what happens is a conversation more often than not. And in that conversation, the C's don't part, but people, other now has a name. And it's really easy to, to be afraid of something or push something aside when it's a concept. But when it's a face and it's a name that you met, it's very, very hard to do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that that's a good segue, I think, to the question that I have for Zach, because it, it, it's, it sort of throws the same question back a couple generations. And, and I guess my question, Zach, is, is, is do you feel like, you know, your, um, your family history of, of basically acting in ways that, that for its both, for its time, we would perceive as, as, absolutely progressive were those things that your grandfather like you know would have been loud about in his community did he did he extend credit to african-american families because it was good business uh did he do it in spite of the fact that it was going to potentially cause harm to his business and how kind of discreet versus um activist oriented would that kind of action be in living a progressive jewish life say at his time Gosh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, and and I don't I don't have the the answer. I, I can I can speculate a bit. Um, from what I understand, my great uncle Will, uh, the UAW union organizer, um, communist, ran for office. You know, in New York City mayor and, and president. He was in jail for three years. I think he was pretty loud about, you know, his his beliefs. I, th- I want to say my grandfather was more subtle. Uh, it was about the deed. It was about saving one life. Um, it, it, it was, um, I don't think he went and tried to make an example of, um, you know, uh, of anything. Um, he died young. He died at 50. He had a heart attack. My dad said the, the, um, my dad tells the story of the funeral and, uh, the black community just came out of the woodworks for, for Benny. Uh, and I think that mattered more to him, um, than going out and having a sort sort of a big social statement about, you know, doing the, the right thing. Cool. Yeah. I just, my, my comment is I kind of see, you know, I came out in 1983, and I think about sort of how where where LGBTQA politics was in 1983 versus where it is in 2022, and um, and just the the evolution from how important those simple quiet acts were to people um, in 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 a way that 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 some of the more uh, the loud stuff that that is really useful today might have actually been um, too frightening or counterproductive. So that is sort of interesting to see kind of how we 
as progressive Jews have sort of changed over time with regards to how we live out progressive values quietly, openly, loudly. It's um, yeah. I, and I think some of it's, yeah, it's just situational too. And mm-hmm. it's, it's what the person feels comfortable with. I, I swear that by no means a humble brag, Savi and I had an Afghan family move in across the street from us. There's a church that has a, um, that has a, a house usually used for missionaries. And, um, uh, and, and they were among the few who were airlifted out. Um, and we like jumped into action and were able to help, help them navigate the social service system and get a lot of stuff done. And they had a good bit of help. He was a student at NC state. I don't know, you know, like we didn't put it on Facebook. We just did it cause it was the right thing. And we're both sort of action as part of our fabric. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't know, you know, if, if somebody did it and then wanted to go talk about it, like, that's great. Like that, that might be the right thing for them. And maybe there are more resources could come for that person and family. I think it's just about you know, style and comfort and also maybe what the sort of the movement requires, you know, sometimes. Right. So sometimes it's, you're changing a life. Sometimes you're changing lives. Sometimes you're changing the world kind of, yeah. Um, yeah. and you have to kind of navigate that and we have to do all of those things. So, well, Suzanne, I'm coming for you. Um, <laughs> so um, tell me a little bit, Susanna, about, uh, about indifference. Um, all, all, that, all I could think about when you were talking was that, that how, how caring is such a wonderful quality, but how caring in, in contemporary uh, partisan politics is, is a challenge for us because we care about their feelings and about honor and truth. And it makes it really hard to fight um, uh, people who don't. So, but tell me like how you think um, we as people who are older than you um, might be able to help people your age and who are still young and and forming their political identities to um, care, to not be indifferent. Um, I think for me, it's just about showing examples to the younger ones, because nowadays I see a lot of people my age, they don't have a care in the world, but they do how it impacts others. I feel like if a lot of the older generation, um, like my grandparents or even my parents, if they were to um, uh, kind of expose themselves in a way, show what what uh show examples of how they helped because my parents were born in 1776 uh during like the civil rights movement and um my grandparents also lived during the time when martin luther king was alive and he was speaking out against that and so i feel like showing them what had what they've done or maybe not what they've done but what we've accomplished in in the time that they've been alive can affect how we how we perceive the world by looking at what hardships we've like that have that have occurred in the past that have a uh that has made our country and our world the way we live today it's a lot better than it was in 1965 and um basically improving and continuing to make the world a better place so it's equal for everyone um, like the LGBTQ, uh, Black, uh, people who are Black or African American, or like people who don't really know who they are. And so I just feel like that's really important for me. Thank you. So um, who else has questions that want to ask for the panel? And do any of the panelists have questions for each other? Oh, Shvi, uh, of course, I see you. So my question is partly personal and certainly political. And that is that, you know, as somebody who has been involved in various progressive teaching and politics all my life, uh, I I feel as we got right now, we're going through some pretty dark times. And, you know, uh, with the upsurge of racism, the environmental crisis, selfishness of people display in regard to the pandemic and so on and so on. I wondered to each, each member of the, of the panel, to the three of you, do you, is it, a, is it questions of hope a problem for you? Do you have dark times in your own 
in your own struggles? I mean, are you just optimistic as you get up every day? Or do you look around and say, oh my God, you know, and things just seem to be so overwhelming that it's hard to hold on to that sense of hope. So if you do have a sense of hope, where does it come from? And, and any three, all three of you, I trust all three of you, so I don't know if Alan likes to start or- Sure. sure. Um, I wish I woke up every morning um, filled <laughs> with, with hope and uh, goodwill. I don't. Uh, I, I purposely reduced the amount of news I watch, read, etc in some way to isolate myself from from a lot of things am i with without am i without hope absolutely not and the hope comes from what i see in my own organization i can't i can't control so much of what happens in the world but i can control, control is the wrong word i can't impact far greater on my own organization. And so I can build in my company, I can build in my relationships, the world I want to live in. And uh, my business partner at the time, when I decided to, to work at Workplace Options, uh, there were only eight people, it was a small company. And he told me that, um, you know, I really can't pay you at all what you were getting paid. I probably, there are going to be months or weeks I may not be able to pay you at all. But I promise you that if you decide to work with me, that we can build the company we both want to work for. So my hope comes from that, that, you know, in the people that we're impacting who work for us, that they will go on and impact others. Susanna or Zach, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, for for me, I as well don't like wake up every morning saying, oh, this is going to be a great day. Uh, oh, it is. Um, but it's not usually always my mindset. But for me, like what does give me hope is that even though like I am still 13, I don't have a job, I am not getting paid, I still go to school. I, it, it just gives me hope that I can make a difference in this world, whether it be small or big, I can have impact on how people view the world or how people like change, how people change their lifestyles or something. Um, I'm really into like helping the environment, although I haven't done much, but I um, I really want to work on that. And I also really want to work on like helping like human rights and protecting human rights of people. Um, and so I just feel like for me, hope is like the things that I can do and also inspiring people who are my age, who don't think they can help, but like kind of showing them that they can, maybe just like helping one person can make a difference to their entire lives and yours. I, I would I would say something similar. Um, and first of all, Sadie texted me that Benny's, our three-year-old's now watching. So hi, Benny. This is not what the basement looks like, I promise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I look, it's tough right now. Like having a three year old and a one year old is tough. Like, you know, later on the pandemic, you know, later on for us extroverts not being able to like have a lot of human contact and, uh, you know, working from home and the toxic political environment and, and keep going down the list. It's just hard. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I would agree with, you know, the other two comments there. I, I yeah, I draw from kind of the personal interaction. Um, you know, what, what, what can I, what can I gain or change on the individual level? Um, you know, from an interaction with a neighbor, uh, you know, who I have a sense we don't agree politically, but like, there's probably 80% we do agree on and, um, you know, having compassion for a loss in the family that 
you know, she's, she's uh, going through right now. There, there's just a lot of these, like the human element um, uh, that like, I think gets lost in sort of the headlines um, uh, that focus on all the things that like we don't have in, in common. Um, you know, that that's teaching a class, being able to change a student's perspective, open them up to the world. Uh, it's, I, I think at a time like this, yeah, it's the, you know, the, what, what one foot in front of another, what, what can I do around, you know, uh, the, 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 the interactions that I do have to, to be able to, to have impact. That's sort of where, where I, you know, where I look to. Hi, Benny. Susan? I was, sorry, I was th thinking about this question and really um, I'm gonna throw it out there anyway, uh, because it's not just for the moderators, but it's for this group. And, and this is such a wonderful group of participants that we have, we're like-minded in that we have an interest in this. But my question is, ideas, thoughts, what um, Beth Meyer can do to um, share these these notions. Suzanne, I'm really Suzanne, I'm really struck by your your um, definition of indifference. And um, I'm not by any means saying, oh, people who aren't here are indifferent. That that's not it. But um, that's a really tough nut to crack. And um, Anyway, I, it can be redundant, but <laughs> people don't have to answer it here, but if you want to, you can. And, and also um, to think about if you think that there are things we're missing, voids, um, Rabbi Eric is still on, but it, um, I think that it, this would be an opportunity just to broaden what we're talking about here because it's really inspiring. So thank you to the, the three speakers for, for sharing yourselves. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer quickly. Um, there's a lot of places I could go here, but I'll, I'll just stay kind of with the thread of like action, um, which is give young people the opportunity to, uh, I don't know, continue with the, 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 the narrative, the heritage, the, you know, um, this piece around, uh, you know, being active and being able to, you know, serve the community um, and, you know, kind of do, do, you know, make, make this world a, a little bit better. Um, it's, 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 so, it's so pervasive in all of our stories. Um, Jews are fighters. Uh, Jews go out and change things. And, and I think, yeah, you know, having, you know, g giving people the opportunity to kind of fulfill that, um, uh, you know, for me, I had so much trouble, like sort of unpacking values and why I do what I do and this, and that, and it, it just, it was all right there. It's because it's what I know. It's what I've learned. It's what I grew up with. It's so I, I think making sure that, um, uh, people, young people in particular, uh, ha have, have those opportunities. Judith. In, uh, in uh, um, thinking about what Susan said and also what a lot of the other people have said, for me, it, it's such um, a personal, uh, personal interactions and it's all about helping other congregation members within right here within our Beth Meyer community. And I think both on the social action level and also on the from the Hesed committee, we need to really become more visible. And I think I, I'm not really sure if as many people are indifferent as we think. Some are indifferent but some are sort of frozen. They're overwhelmed with all the possible things that are wrong and 
giving them maybe a few ideas about what they can do to become unstuck. I think maybe um, will be inspirational. And Suzanne is such an inspiration, especially to the young people. Not that you other guys aren't great as well. Um, but it, even the young people, um, in terms of um, giving people ideas about what social action does, or what has said does within the Beth Meyer community, and maybe specific things they can do maybe something that we can do it as a congregation. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, Deborah. Um, I think that everybody's already sort of said this, but let me just break it down because that's what I do. Um, I think that the, that, that what all of the speakers have said and what other people have said is it can be overwhelming. It's a crazy world. It's always been a crazy world. Um, but if you can if you can break it down to small actions, they don't often seem like they're making any difference, right? You look at the the people who are starving and you say, well, I make sandwiches and I feed a family. What difference does it make? But it makes a difference. Maybe it just makes a difference to that family, but that's important too. So I think that one of the things, one of the mistakes we often make, two things, but one of the things we often, one of the mistakes we often make in progressive politics is that we tend to look at the macro and not the micro and the macro can be overwhelming some of us are all about advocacy and we love that and we're you know all all gung-ho about that and that's great but that's longer term something that you can do in the small term is the micro and I think it's I think I think it's just what Judith is saying if you can get and Susanna said as well if you can give people a specific thing that they can do and they can see results about from it right away it's something that both makes them want to do more and also makes a difference in the world that's really tangible and i think the other thing is that we have to um i have to it's i think it's important to think about these small actions in just what our panelists have talked about in terms of jewish values because when we start to talk about them in again, in the micro, macro sense, we run into all kinds of issues about, you know, what are your politics and what party you belong to and who do you support and blah, 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 blah. And those are important. I mean, in my opinion, those are all important issues, but who cares whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, you've never voted in your whole life. If you're gonna make a sandwich for somebody and their, their kids aren't gonna go hungry over the weekend because they only eat at school, right? So. I think that those are both really important pieces of the way that we can get more people involved. Alan. So uh, I think in regards to our own congregation or even, even wider, it, the key aspect is engagement. And engagement isn't just around communication. It isn't around marketing. It's around talking. And it's around accepting silence, not as a tacit yes or, or an implicit no, but as silence. And that there may be someone who's uncomfortable or unwilling to talk. So just asking the question, why? Or what do you think? Or what would you like? That, that active effort to engage with someone makes a massive uh, amount of difference. Doesn't always get you where you want to go, but it at least gets a dialogue and that that's a start. I, I will take the privilege of the moderator and say that um, to dovetail off of that, that, you know, you know, I come from a family that is both Catholic and not progressive to be nice. Um, and the, you know, the issue of indifference, you know, for, for me and my sister, you know, a Thanksgiving argument several years ago turned into a barroom conversation that, that where we really, where, where we realized, no, it's not that she's indifferent. It's not that I'm crazy. It's that we, we both care about our neighbor, but we define the word neighbor differently. Like that's really, you know, what it boiled down to. Right. So it's like, you know, everybody cares about somebody, and, you know, so when you, when you think about folks who you think are acting like they don't care, it, oftentimes it's because they've defined 
who they're responsible for differently or who they should care about differently, right? Like only Jews or only people who think like them or only Americans or only white people. Like those those sorts of um, breaking the definition of who they're supposed to care about rather than just, you know, challenge telling them that they don't care is, is a, is, is a um, sometimes a nice way to um, uh, hook in. And I think also those of us who do interact with folks who clearly disagree with us on political issues have to find some point of commonality, hear each other, reflect one another's feelings so that we know the other person understands us before you start defining the differences, because then you start to realize that the differences are clear, but at least you can start to respect them. <clears throat> Questions? I'm scanning. Hey, Jim. Hey, hey. This is Robin. Robin. Yeah. Um, I just like to say that this whole talk has been so inspiring and connecting and um, I would I would love to see more of this, more conversations like this. And and to Susanna's point, you know, intergenerational um, uh, story sharing, storytelling sharing all of these kinds of things that people are talking about today, that um, it also, besides giving an example for the younger people, it may be like for me today, remembering from my childhood all of those points and examples that were given and not talked about and, and to um, just bring to the forefront again of the way to live, you know, that in, to consciously make that Jewish values uh, as my parents did. Um, and I, I would just, I'm just grateful for all the speakers and um, I would love for more of this to be happening within our community and and partnering, you know, social action partnering with the, with the younger students and kind of ex giving examples like Susanna was saying, there's so many good ideas that are coming from this today. So thanks to everybody. That's it. Okay, anybody else have something they wanna say? Rabbi, Deborah, speakers, Linda. Yeah, um, so all of this discussion has been great and I, it's made me think about, you know, what we can do at Beth Meyer to, you know, um, do our Jewish values when we're in contact with our shul, like anytime you walk in the door, there could be something that, you know, a, a small, whatever it is to, you know, express the value of whatever, you know, help the poor, help people get food, um, you know, justice in some way. Whatever you're doing, even like coming in for services, there could be one thing while we're there that addresses something about, you know, acting on our values and, and doing a small mitzvah while we're there. And we do it a lot already, like we have food collections and clothing collections at, you know, when you walk in the door. But, you know, let's say every religious school class, every time they're there, there is some kind of a, a uh, mitzvah, social action mitzvah, or uh, you know, repair the world mitzvah that is done while they're there. An adult ed, any kind of meeting or minion or anything. I think we might be able to get people's minds going, you know, about all these small things in our lives that, you know, ha allow you to live this, live the Jewish, you know, way. So that's what came to my mind. Like, how can we weave it throughout everything we do when we come? And then maybe they'll take it home. Mm -hmm. Thought 
just a thought. <laughs> yeah. Jim, I have something to say again, Robin. Hey, Robin. Um, I, I agree with that, Linda. And I also have always thought that the word progressive turns people away from what we're saying. And I mean, what, remember I wanted to call this thing, are you progressive and don't know it? Because um, everything we're talking about here, I think that most people in our community would, would embrace and try to maybe do more or, or do a more example about, but how do we get over the word progressive of people wanting to interact? and explore and get to know each other. It seems to have a divide. I don't have any answers, just a thought. Okay, well on that note, I think we're, we'll wrap this up. Do you, are there some um, closing words that someone is wanting to make who isn't me, Svi or Deborah or Rabbi Solomon. <laughs> Go for it, Svi. Svi. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have uh, a whole lot to say other than that I think that the, what we had conceptualized, thought about as this kind of program has borne fruit exactly in the way that I think we hoped it would. Um, I mean, one of the, dimension of this is to allow people in our community to see others in our community of all generations, by the way, and that's one of the things that is important, people of different generations um, who are in, in various ways active and committed to social change in the world and making the world a better place. And um, I think that was our, our intention, is to give a voice, give a platform for some of the people who are active in this community, of course, as people have mentioned, we know there are many more in our community who are committed, involved, um, are active in various social, moral, political um, activities. So um, I want to thank Alan, and I want to I want to thank Zach. I want to thank Susanna. You've all been really wonderful, and uh, have I think borne out uh, the hopes that we would have for this this particular event. And I think it's inspired us to continue with this particular kind of programming to find others in our community who also um, could, you know, could have this kind of platform. So I want to thank you. I want to thank the organizers, which is me and others <laughs> for putting this together. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing people again on our other PK events, our progressive community events. And uh, with that, uh, stay warm, stay safe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thank you so Thank you, much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. All right. So proud. I'm going to close this out if everybody's good. Stay warm, stay safe. Have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>